Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. I understand it's a very difficult time of the day here in cyber camp, and I understand that there's a lot of information going around in your head. So we hope we have an interesting presentation for you, that you enjoy it. And we'd like you to get a number of resources and ideas from this workshop, everything that we have been working on has been done over time. It's a question of downloading everything and then putting it into practice. So this is the index that we have for today. We'll have an introduction to threat hunting, uh, what we do in this field of work to give you the basis. And then we'll talk about some cases of uh, cyber criminals. And I think that's the core of our presentation in terms of the environments that we have in threat hunting. We'll also do a bit of attack simulation. And then we'll reflect on all the work that we've done today with some case studies and a playbook. At the end, the conclusions and some resources that I think are very important that's in this field of work and that will bring us to the end of the presentation. So, who are we? They've already introduced us, but uh, I met Carlos when he was responsible for forensics in an area of cybersecurity, and I was looking for somebody to help me in my day-to-day -day work, and I found a number of people that was interested in, but he was the youngest of them. I think you were 17, weren't you? And uh, we got on uh, very well. He had a great CV, and we've worked really well together. Thank you very much, Florian. We work together. He is currently working in Indra, and he works in uh, response to incidents and threat hunting. We collaborate with cyber cooperants, and... Um, we work in and out of uh, Madrid. I need you to copy the QR with your mobile or copy that code and answer this interactive uh, question. It's very easy. So get your mobiles out, put on the QR detector, and soon we'll see the results. You can do it on the QR or via the web. So you, we can use this information to adapt the workshop a little bit to our needs. So the graph is coming up now. We have already three participants. People can even do it at home. Everybody can get involved, yes. It's just a question of going to the uh, link and using that if you haven't got a QR code scanner. We want to adapt the workshop accordingly to see if we go into more depth or not, uh, although we've actually only got a couple of hours to work with. We'll see what we can manage. It would seem that the direct results say that people do have an understanding of this field. Uh, we had the idea that perhaps people wouldn't know so much about threat hunting, but it looks pretty good. I think we can leave this information here for the moment and move on to the next slide. So let's go to the basis, the background. It's important for you to understand about threat hunting and have that background information. So we have the life cycle for a cyber security client, and this is essential for this work of threat hunting. It's important to understand all the stages of an incident. So what professionals get involved in this field? It requires a number of skills from various professions. The most offensive side with the skills that a hacker might have, and then the administrator, the system administrator side, somebody who understands how things work internally, 
with through Windows or Linux and so on. It's an important part for analysts, the person who responds, and then forensics. We are in the part of forensics. We respond to a number of incidents, and that offensive part is the most difficult part. Um, we've done a number of workshops for that, and we'll have a look at that in a moment. This is the hardest bit of all. This image gives us an idea of the full cycle for, in terms of threat hunting. So we'll start with the hunting part, and we'll create a number of hypotheses. We might call this the, uh, the covering or the, the criminal behind the threat and the infrastructure of the attack. Then we're going to little, do a little bit of investigation. What do these cyber criminals use? What software do they have? What techniques and what tactics? We'll find out about the organization, the client, and then we'll increment and get further into the process. So we've done one part and we'll have a result on which we can continue improving through the different stages that we will see later on. And then we move on to the next level. And the next level is something that gives us the basis of use. So if this happens and somebody attacks me, a cyber criminal attacks me, I need to have a system that alerts me of that. That is the last stage. And we'll have a look at the cases of use and how it is implemented, and that would be the full life cycle. There we have it, then. So let's move on to the next slide. This is very important. In cybersecurity, people tend to take their own journey and don't share their journey. And uh, you will have heard a lot about standards, but uh, that's the way it is. To do threat hunting, we believe that it's important to talk about magma, um, cases of use, and TIT, threat hunting methodology. So this would be the very famous pyramid of threat hunting. What is the basis of this? You will have heard about this in uh, CyberCam because there have been forensics that have explained this. These are the techniques, the procedures and the methodology. So here we have the uh, first three. And there are a number of artefacts that are very difficult to find as well. Though the, the rest of the elements are perhaps a bit more trivial. So uh, there's more emphasis on the first three parts in the Taiki. So on the right hand side then you have all of the different uh, phases. This is all very well documented and we'll see it over the coming slides, uh, it'll be a little bit different. We'll have the initial phase and the second phase of the hunt and then the final phase. I forgot to mention that it's very important to have a knowledge of the client's infrastructure. Often in threat hunting, we can be working with just one business or with several businesses. And it's important to have the knowledge of the infrastructure in that company. There are many that are very, very big, and it's very difficult to understand the infrastructure, and that's understandable. But a basic idea of how the infrastructure is established is important. And very often you might come across companies that don't actually have an a, a infrastructure. Obviously in the day-to-day -day, it's very difficult. It can get quite a bit more complicated depending on the, on the degree of complexity. There is a link there, as you can see, and it will take us to an Excel. And I suggest that you download it and you'll see it's really quite useful because it shows you the at the top there, you can see it, 
There are different levels and proposals that you can use for threat hunting. We can use them, we can change them, we can add more and start working. This is just like a basis to have some indicators of how to work in threat hunting. There are a number of uh, methodologies and a number of tactics on which we have worked over the months, and uh, we can reflect them here. Other resources that you can have, and we could talk a lot about these, but we've just put uh, the ones on here that we have used. Sigma, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Anybody? A couple of people. I really recommend it. It's a, an excellent project. And it, it aims to set a standard for configuration of very sims and it gives you cases and rules that you need to to follow in order to to work with that you can turn them into different um, opportunities it's this kind of a, a google translate in a way some of them aren't uh, too great some of them are a bit uh, general but this is our work as analyzers and to implement this into our system. We're going to talk about AT and CK and other applications for virtual environments. So let's continue with this part. We are analyzing, when we're analyzing Spain, we can see that there are a number of attacks. It's um, SMOTET and a number of different uh, attacks that have been suffered in different groups in Spain. And uh, this gives us an idea of how they work, what's their techniques, what's their background, how do they work. And for that we use a, a mitre. In our workshop here today, we're going to try and get all the knowledge that is available out there. I'm uh, sure you've seen this before. It's very comprehensive. It's got the pre-attack section on the left. It also covers the part of cloud, and there's also a mobile section. There's also a, a, a navigator, that's the URL that you have there, and you can use that to see how a group can work. So we uh, select it, and you can continue looking at that, and we'll see that in our lab session. And this is an example of a group. We have uh, Lazarus. Anybody familiar with that? They've been working for a long time. Anybody know what the origin of that group is? It's uh, quite difficult, isn't it? People say that uh, they could be from the north. You can see the identification there. Might have as an, an ID to, for that identification but uh, it also says they have been given many different names. There's indications of where they think they're from, what is their background, which is very, very complex. They're actually quite famous for the attack they did on Sony. Anybody familiar with that attack that they did on Sony? Yeah, it was kind of a, a revenge. I talked about that about a year, ago, a year ago when I gave a talk on that. And you can find information about that. It's really quite comprehensive. You can see all the kind of tools that they use, how they work, and you just have to go on there, click on there in MITRE, and you get all of that. 
I should also say about the security tools that they're taking on this framework. This is a, an example of Sandbox, which is very fi famous. So this is a malignant software and the result that it gives you using MITRE. We can go to one of the areas that we're interested, interested in and click on it, and then we can analyze where it's from. But we have all this in a single viewpoint, and that's uh, really quite helpful. So let's uh, talk about the different environments that we have to start off with. The first one uh, is Detection Lab. It's a set of machines, and they have a small business infrastructure. What does it contain? Well, all of these applications can be OSQuery, LetterScript, Sysmen, for example. We'll talk a bit more about this later on. What, it's, what is it used for? and how it helps us when we're collecting all the information and filtering uh, events, particularly on Windows. And the transcript will help us to register all the movements. And there is a number of other applications that we'll see later on. These are some of the technical requirements for Detection Lab. You can see that in GitHub, and you can download it, the requirements uh, that uh, it calls for are up on there. We need to have Packer and Vagrant. We have used VirtualBox. It can be done with VMware or AWS. And we need to substitute background for Terraform. But that's a completely different presentation. For another day. So this is a description of what every machine has. We have the uh, the server. All of these machines collect the information and sent is sent through the client. We'll see a demo now about the infrastructure, how we administer our infrastructure, and so on. We have all the machines here, the logger and the directory and so on. So, all this environment, thanks to Apache Guacamole, uh, which is the application that helps us administer the machines through our computer, and it is quite useful. Uh, to access machines from the same place. Como vemos aquí, tenemos toda la máquina. Now, as you can see here, we've got several machines, and we're going to get into Windows 10 client. Y vamos a lanzar un ataque. And what we're going to do is we're going to. Uh, launch an attack with Atomic Red Team, the, uh, which this laboratory installs, so we can simulate the attacks through PowerShell in this case. So once we open PowerShell, uh, we're doing it with admin privileges so that we can uh, launch as many attacks as possible, because some attacks need this kind of privileges. So whilst this is... Um, Starting, we're going to open the other machine against which we're going to launch another attack, in this case with Power Exploit. Because at the end of the day, our objective is to fill those uh, infected logs, and then we're going to get through the Sysmo configuration to launch an attack and make some noise so we can then see exactly what happened. Now, let's go on to the route where our tool is, Atomic Red Team. No 
nos desplazamos a so we move la táctica que queremos aplicar on to the tactic that we want to apply in este caso hemos seleccionado la ejecución in this case we have selected execution which is T1086 the one from PowerShell which we really really like and then we're going to be able to fiddle a little bit with it and do our playbook on that. So it's as easier, it's easier as just launching that script, letting it execute and uh, some processes that it does are done um, in the background. So in a few seconds it's going to tell us that it's going to close as you can see now. And through the task manager we can see that PowerShell is actually working on the background. So you can see here it shows that it's making a lot of noise but little by little it's going to start advancing and in the end it's going to give us an output if it's been able to do it properly. Now we're going to do the same procedure but in this case instead of atomic rep team we're going to use power exploit I'm going to zoom in a little bit because I don't know if you can see it properly So we launch one of the tests, the first one, code execution. And in this case, you can see that it keeps showing us the calculators, several calculator, calculators, also notepads, and we're going to let it work because it takes some time, as I was saying. And now let's look into what the first script on Windows 10 is doing. So it's going to run 14 tests one by one. You can see them here. This was Atomic, yeah? The one we've launched for Windows 10, the first one we launched. So you can see here all the tests that it has launched. Now, if you look at the commands, which are here at the bottom, there's a variable, which is URL, which is the one it's referencing to at the top. In this case, it's on GitHub, so it downloads it from there and then it executes it. Some of the tests require for it to download files that are on GitHub. As you can see, there are different ones here. And um, this one, for example, is creating users with its description, with permissions, with name, everything. And you can see all the other tests that it's launching. And we will see afterwards if everything that we've launched is really returning the logs that we're looking for. Now, have, how have we created this infrastructure? Because this um, infrastructure is not just about pressing a button and letting it work. Only a part of it is. So I'm going to tell you which failures we've obtained and how to solve them, because we've done this a few times. I've got almost one terabyte of hard drive with two or three installations of this lab uh, whilst testing it to see all the fail failures that we were getting um, because our objective at the end of the day is to show you our experience this is a great lab but uh, we have found um, different um, issues and we've solved them so we want to show them to you so you can do this at home so we have downloaded the git where the repository is and we've just followed the steps, so we now execute the script. Then I'll show you how we do it and what command we have to give it for that uh, to be executed as quickly as possible. And the issue we have found here, uh, because it works when you download it, that's building all those machines, but 
When it is getting on to the last machine, which is uh, Windows 10, we find an issue. Uh, it says that it has been successfully completed, but that machine has not been created. Now, what do we do here? What we do is we commend a few lines, 207 to 214 in this case, and these show us whether the machine has been created so that if we by mistake execute this command again then it will tell us that the machines have already been created so this is basically checking uh, if there's already a machine and so with this we cancel the script but it checks that all of the machines are there and then it will realize the windows and it's not there and then it will create it so by commenting lines, we uh, solve that issue. Now, as you can see here, we've got the description of all those machines that obviously need some resources. So with this file here, where we have all the configuration, we see everything. We see where the ISOs are going to be downloaded, the images of the virtual machine, the name that it's going to assign to it, the characteristics and features. And once the machine has been lifted, it will give it a script which is going to create the system and install all the applications that we're going to need to do our threat hunt. So let's see the results now. See if they're done. Well, as you can see here, there's some noise. And, as you can see here, Windows 10 Atomic Red Team says that the process has been successfully completed and little by little we're going to start getting these messages. Obviously, there are. Anyway, let's go on to S Plan and let's see what we've got here and how we can treat all that information. Uh, we've got a Splan Enterprise, which is a demo version. You can all get it if you want it. And actually, these machines give you a license for free and everything. This is S Plunk. And by default, we don't have the threat hunting threat hunting uh, module, but this application does have it, and this is a very good application. Uh, it's very um, visu visual because of the graphics and the way it represents data, and you will be able to see it as soon as this is um, loaded. You'll see the movements and even the tactics that have been used, as well as the techniques on the side, as well as the number of times that these have been executed. We can always set the range and decide which range we want to use. And if we go on my coverage, we can see the number of times that these actions have been executed and a graph, uh, which is the same one that Lorian showed us earlier. Yeah, so you can see the matching with MITRE, little counting of everything that has been created on this lab. Uh, yeah, we've been working a lot with it this week. Now, so this is one of the um, searches and browsers that I really like because uh, it allows us to filter by technique and we can also exclude hosts, for example. And let's just input our technique, which is T1086. So once we load, if the data have loaded properly, then we get all the information as output. You can see that there are several pages. 
And from here, you, you see this is the URL I was telling you about, which uh, mentioned um, file download, which is one of the tests that we were seeing. And here you can see that it's been executed. Now, another one of the dashboards that I really like uh, the module that we have activated before, which uh, registers all uh, the movements of PowerShell. And here you can see everything that's been executed through PowerShell. So you can see all the movements and where the byload has loaded. It's a test.ps1. So you've got different tests on different locations. And there are several filters as well with the names, the machines, the things that have been executed. And all in all, this is very useful because then we know the technique. We've got the PowerShell code. And this allows us to then see all the attacks that we have generated into the infrastructure. Now, this is all very well uh, when it comes to visual representation. But for us, in order to be quicker and more agile when we do this, we have generated a series of queries that we're going to launch now. We're going to show you some of them. Yeah, just to explain where this comes from, we've got a lot of information uh, that PowerShell has given us. We've done um, some research with the resource that we have mentioned before. People have uploaded information. Can you hear me? Now? Yeah, there we go. People can upload information to this web resource, uh, a lot of Sigma, Sigma rules that for me have been very useful to see what people have uh, been sharing. Sharing information is key. And we see here that we've got 16 rules that we have taken from there, and these refer to attacks with PowerShell. Now, this is very powerful. Then we have translated it into this plug, and we have adapted it for this uh, workshop. As my colleague was saying, we're going to launch a search with this tactic. So what we're going to do now, we are um, for, to, to search for this tactic, we associate it with an index. What we have seen in this case is that the usual index was not giving us results. So in this infrastructure, it has its own index to associate all the data. And the, the index in this case was fair hunting. Yeah, because the configuration of this machine gives its own format. But it, it took us a day to realize that, by the way. But anyway, it's here. And we've launched a search, and we've said just bring whatever you have on T1086, which is a PowerShell technique. But whilst we're here, we've said, well, let's just uh, launch a few more searches. And as you can see, this looks for files on uh, the drive with uh, the PowerShell extension, which is PS1. And so we're going to be able to see the commands that have been executed. And these are, here they are, classified by hosts. And as you can see, all these instructions have been executed. And this is very useful to check whether this works properly with the machines and which logs it has uh, recovered and which it hasn't recovered. And that is very interesting as well, of course. Now, if we want to search commands by administration in all the environments that we have deployed, or in this case, we're going to do three. Obviously, in an organization, there aren't only three systems. 
but in, in this case it works because this is a small lab and this, in, in this way we can go fast and we can see everything that to do with PowerShell. We even have the forwarder here which is what we used to send the, the logs. Here they are classified by machine, by log. We have uh, references to Git as well. And as we go on, we're going to see the last command execution through PowerShell, which has been filtered by the MITRE category. This is a bit hard to do like this. I know we're going really fast, but we don't have that much time. And anyway, you will be able to then check this again on the internet. And here I'll choose a category. Basically, what we're doing here is all on execution. So we see the time that has been done. We've got a registry here from the other day when I was working on this. So this is just to show you that you can see everything here. For example, this is using WME. Anyway, you, you've got everything here, yeah? And now we're going on to the one which is the most complete. We can filter by time, technique, host, in an orderly way. As you can see, we have quite a lot of results. Some of them are from the other day when we were working. Now, if we check the events, uh, and this is one of the reasons why we like Splunk, because you can easily see information about the hosts. You get the percentage of shorts where it has taken the information from. We can see the values, uh, the technique values. Um, we also see in more detail, you probably know Splunk already by now, but anyway, it, it's a wonder, really, the, the amount of information that we get. And we also, I mean, we're going to show you alternatives as well. There are, there are several alternatives. So, um, after working with Detection Lab, we decided that this infrastructure um, needs very high resources, so we decided to create our own lab at home. And this we did by reducing the application deployment in order to uh, deploy the environment in a more easy, in an easier way. Because uh, we haven't mentioned other things that this environment has, such as OS Query, which uh, we saw the other day here. Um, and our um, colleague told us in detail about OS Query, and we wanted to actually talk about it, but um, it's already been said, and uh, this is in this tool. This is a very useful tool for system administration, for um, finding IOCs in a language, but um, in, in SQL language. Uh, so if you can, uh, just have a look at the project, because it's very interesting. No, no. We decided not to use it in our lab. You can see on here from left to right that the two of us are there working on our computers and this is displayed down into a Windows server, which is Windows 10. And what I mentioned was the clients, and they've all been configured with the Sysmon configuration. And we'll see that later on. So that we can see all the information that is being collected. This is a little bit different to the one we saw before. We did a couple of tests on the information that uh, was pro was provided before, and then we have a SPLAM cloud here. And the last of, of all of them is Caldera. We decided to download it onto a server 
because it, this is the best way of uh, generating information with uh, Caldera. This is the structure, and I'll talk a bit more about Caldera later on, because you will see that it's quite simple and you can do it. We just need a server and the windows to have a little mini infrastructure for a, a mini attack. Well, we'll do that a little bit later on. This, these are the characteristics of our simple server and the technical details of that. What's the good about the work we've done with Sysman? Anybody know Sysman here? It's a tool. It needs an ad hoc configuration of what we're looking for. So you can see this installation is very simple. We have the commands. It needs to be an XML and needs to be adapted to our needs. So what did we decide to do with that XML? We decided to use these two algorithms and a number of filters depending on the elements that I'm interested in. Uh, if we put iMatch include, then we'll include that on match include, so that it is then later recorded from the system. And with a forwarder, it can be sent through to our system. That's the process. And that's a pretty good configuration. Now we've got the basis of Swift on security. You've got the links there. You can play around with a bit with that, do some modifications, and using your own host, and do a virtual attack. And you see how all those processes flow down in a pack. We're going to map what happens in C user, in program data, and in Windows temp. With uh, people who work with uh, malware, like to have a very reclusive area in which all these malicious entities can enter. It can also be used for administration of systems, but also for the map, so it's all registered here. We're going to register all this basis, of course. It's very important. The basis of the script as well in Java, of course. We register everything that we're interested in and move on to the next filter regarding the suspicious ports. We have a reference and on the right you have a description of the why. You can have a look at it and uh, spend a bit of time on that, have a coffee. It took me a while the first time. We register what we want on the proxy level. And, of course, in the ports, and we go into another section here. So what do we want to register? No. At the bottom, you can see the domains. When Windows uh, updates, we know that's fine, and there's no issues with that. So we do the configuration based on our needs. So let's have a look at persistence. It's very important to control everything that happens in terms of persistence. That's the first thing that malware can do. We log all of this information and look at all the incidents and events that could be the beginning of an attack. .hpa and so on and so on. So, in terms of creation, we're going to do a script with a number of services. 
Here we have one from Microsoft. And of course, we have our forwarder. We have the Splunk here. So we're going to uh, not take that into account here. And we're ready. So this is the configuration, if we say, of our lab. If we're doing this from home, this is great. If you already know Detection Lab, and in our case we, in our case we did, we said, okay, let's do something. It might be a little bit simple, but it'll be useful in order to be able to control a an origin and goes. We use a machine, and it's all sent through to Spunk Cloud. So, in terms of infrastructure, we had the basics, and we're going to talk a little bit more about other tools now. This is the one that I started off with in this sector. It was soft ELK. There are many different components. Here you have the link. It's a virtual machine, and you can download it. It's got an elevated resistance, and there's a lot of software behind it. So it does need a lot of RAM. With eight gigabytes of RAM, you're OK. Some people do it with six, but then I don't know how they manage to do a decent search. You can download this. And I've done this. I executed, and it's really easy. We're not going to go into depth on this. It's just a machine that's used in lots of uh, training situations for threat hunting, for incident response. And it has a log that you download it, and you set it to work, and off you go. It looks at co how you're compromised, that it's all configured and set up, so it's very, very easy. So now let's talk about HELK. What did you think when you saw HELK? I thought it was uh, amazing. You'll see it's rather different to what we've seen before in Detection Lab, but we'll see it now. There are many components, and that's what makes it so big. So, in terms of requirements, it's similar to the one we saw before. You've got the GitHub there for you. Any of you familiar with Roberto Rodriguez? He's a reference in this field, and there's a lot of information in this GitHub. We've also included uh, something else. Uh, by a collaborator, it's Mordor. We'll see, we'll see this in working now in a moment. It has all these different components in terms of software, and it's really rather good. We checked it, and we've seen that it's really rather good. Help can be installed anywhere. You can download it onto your server, as we have done, install it onto your computer, and then you go through the process. It tells you the steps that you have to take in order to set up the installation and how to upload the data for a test. It was on stop. So once it's off, it's wonderful. It looks, it needs to upload the process. So uh, whilst that's going on, we'll have a look at something else. Let's have a look at what we already had open before. This uh, screen here with Carlos is pretty full. 
We've used this circuit because it's easier to cop the, copy the commands and so on. Okay, it's ongoing now. So in the meantime, I'm going to have a look at this. Here you have all the links. So let's have a little bit of a browse through here. It's all set out in categories, all the data, and there are a number of examples and a number of logs that have already been created. So easily with this uh, you can import, and we'll do that, because it's a shame that our computer isn't working. You can see everything they've done, a series of data, you can see that it's pretty good. You've got the GitHub there. This is already prepared, you create your own server and you have to do the installment and indicate the principal docker and so on and so on. I think you have four options. I chose the most simple of them all, number one. And it's very basic and I just went with that. You'll see there are four options. If you go to the fourth one then you'll need a very powerful computer. It's for threat hunting and so on. It's very, very good. But it does have a number of requirements. So on here, I'm going to inject quite a bit of data, like what we did before with Detection Lab. Yeah, we could do that. Of course we could. But I've downloaded this from a rip of the IP of the machine and this uh, day shop and the, here you have all the information it takes you to the web and I can see all of this data as simple as that I think it's pretty useful if you'd like to start now then uh, you it's pretty easy What I was saying, okay, we've got the machine that's working now, we've got these two files, the installation of Helk and Mordor. On the left here we have the data sets and we have a few. What have we been using in this workshop? Well, this one here. Let's go to this one. We've zipped the file and we have a number of commands and this is the one. So we open it up and we'll see what it all consists of, this log. You've got all the dates here. On the right hand side we've got more information, but we'll see it a lot better here in our environment. We're crossing our fingers, it'll work. So we just did the configuration and we put in the IP. It's not working on the stopper. The computer is uh, pausing right now, but we'll restart and it'll all work perfectly well. Let's give it another try. Ah, te imaginas que sale. Uh, ya, te rebut. Eh, lo que vamos a hacer, eh, pues, 
esto tenemos vamos a sacar el vídeo I think we're going to have to use the video that we've got here whilst it starts up we can uh, look at the information using a video we also we always need a backup this can happen aquí comento pues toda la parte de aquí lo que estoy haciendo Okay, now it's working. I had one IP, he had another, and visually it's pretty attractive. We have some data over here that's matched with MITRE. I'm going to see the one about attack. If I want to look about mobiles, I select that and I learn about the ones related to mobiles. It's pretty good. I apply the selection. This is a data set. I think I've put eight in. So it's using all that information. We've got the cloud and a number of techniques. And I can determine the execution. It's filtering now. I can see those uh, data souls. And this is focusing here on PowerShell. And I think it's pretty interesting. It's showing you some different filters now, what I was talking to you about previously. These are all the movements and the steps we've taken previously. So let's go ahead and do a search. So now that we've put in a data set, we need to see the information it can provide. We filter based on a date taken from the data set. I do a little mitigation to see what might have executed it. that. We can do a little visual here to stop the processes online and we can see the results that are included in this cell. This was a visual view. These are the servers, the hosts on which it has been working, the ones that are infected. Okay, this is from the 19th. So we've got the image of the host and its ectic a power cell, but it's encoded. You can't see it easily. So what we do is go and do the corresponding search. It's uh, very well known for used in CTFs, and I've used it a lot myself. And it, you can see it uh, very easily. We do a filter. Let's see what the PowerShell is trying to do. And we noticed that there's something with a PHP. And there's something referring to a Windows register. And then it does a set on that registry, which is nothing good. Then you can see the strings as well. And finally, what we can see is the logging process, PHP, and then again on 64. So we take that codification and we're going to see what it is trying to do because from that it's going to download another resource and that is probably where the malware is. So we do this and we see that that is the address and this is how you can do a quick investigation with the data set that this application gives us. So we've got different data sets. We've got one where we can look for groups. We talked about Lazarus earlier. Uh, here we can select the group and we can learn. 
Could we do this through MITRE, through its website? Yes, but here we've got it in a different way, and we could choose which one we wanted to work with. If we chose Lazarus, for example, here you can see that it is launching the search and that they use a series of relationships. We can see all the information there is. And obviously, uh, this information comes from the MISA framework, but it be, it's uh, shown in a different way. We've got other dashboards which are very interesting, for example, investigating a host. And as we were talking about Sysmo, let's show you a dashboard which is uh, exclusively for Sysmo. Why would we use this? We could uh, infect, for example, if, if I wanted to see ID4, then I can see all the information just by inputting it here. And we can see all the registers that have been generated. And we've got others as well, of course. But you can do this at home on, on your own. And now let's see if this has actually lifted. Yeah, it has. Well, we've got help here and hunting. This is by default, by the way. So you can see it's pretty aesthetic. Uh, the dashboards are already done. Or you can launch a search with the data that we have infected. And, well, you can see that it's working fast now. As we rebooted it, it started working better. And here we can launch all our searches and just fiddle a little bit around with this application, which is really, really recommended. Now let's continue with the presentation now. And here we're going to ask you in the same way that we did earlier, uh, that we do exactly the same thing that we did earlier with the QR code. We're going to um, reboot it so you can answer. You've got the QR code there at the top. If you cannot use the QR, you can use the link and then input the code. And please answer the question. Al final, lo que tenemos son los cuatro entornos que hemos expuesto. So, at the end of the day, what we have is four environments, and we would like uh, you, to, we would like to know which one you like best. That's what we have told you. Which one uh, has drawn your attention more, Carlos? What, what do you reckon the result is going to be? Well, I just I really like Helk. Ahí vamos contestando. Lo accedemos a a ese a ese QR. Please keep answering, use the QR, let's see how this is going. Right, here we are. We've got 11 people who've answered. Uh, you can you can do it from home as well, Ams. If you're watching us on streaming, you can answer the question. Yeah, they're very, very different. Actually, we're just talking about the difference could um, uh, be we could have material enough in another workshop. One has many more security applications, which are at the order of the day. The project has over two years, but in the last month, uh, they've the really kicked it off. So we, we think that this is very um, complete and we like obviously our lab because we've done it ourselves because there we have taken everything that would have interest 
to us and that fulfilled our um, needs. And then obviously you've got help, which is very good because uh, from a visual point of view, it's uh, wonderful. And in order to learn about head hunting, you can inject a lot of data sets and you can study each and every one of the techniques. So I think the, the, the answer is a generic one. All of them are good depending on the state you're in. If you know a bit um, more, you can start with Detection Lab. If not, you can try with Helk. If you want to find out new things, Detection Lab is really good as well. And then obviously it depends on the resources you have. Because sometimes with Detection Lab, you need at least 20 giga. But if you have eight on your computer, then you can have help and take the data set from order. Yeah, if you have a very basic machine, we'll use those, or you can also use soft LK. We've got 18 answers now. We're going to make it trail now. And, ooh, Helg has won. Well, we're not surprised. Right, and now let's go on to attack simulation. As we were mentioning earlier on our home lab, uh, there is Caldera, that's the one we've used to emulate the attacks. But now let's look a little bit more in detail uh, what Caldera is. Uh, this is built on the MITRE ATT and CK. They have created it with a lot of plugins so we can work with it. And now let's look into detail what those plugins are and what we can use them for. Now, as you can see, this machine has been configured. I have um, used three giga and two core, one core. It doesn't have to be uh, very resourceful. You do need high resources because at the end of the day, all we need to do is launch attacks. Right, let's deploy Caldera's machine. And, well, I cannot have on this computer 20 machines active at the same time, so I'm going to use Windows 10 and DC, so Detection uh, Lab, to relaunch those attacks in that infrastructure. And at the same time, we're going to visualize through Splunk those attacks and see if they have registered correctly. So whilst we launch Caldera, let's reboot Windows 10. Yeah, because we've been demanding a bit too much from it. So we're going to show you just how attacks are generated with Caldera. That's what we thought at the beginning. But whilst we have this, let's just try and register everything and launch the attacks. And then you can see how they register on the other one. And in this way, you can see the full picture. So on the uh, one hand, we have attacked the machines, and then externally, we have used Caldera to do the tests. So let's lift with Caldera's machine now. Right, if Caldera doesn't work, then it would really be bad luck because it's never ever failed before. Windows 10 uh, from DC Lab, sometimes it needs a bit more resources than the default ones because sometimes when you launch the attack, it turns itself off, but it is true that we demand too much from it. Y 
ya aprovecho mientras que se va cargando esto, And whilst this is loading, a, a ver dos simuladores de ataque. Let's uh, see two caldera. attack simulators. One is going to be with uh, Caldera and the other one which is by the way uh, Caldera is open source and another one uh, which is not open source is Simulate. It is impossible to see it in detail because it is very complete, but we're going to look at one of the modules and how they simulate the attacks. It's not working, so we're probably going to use a video because it's taking a bit too long. Our backup. And I'm sure that once you've watched the video, it will start working. Ese no, no preocupa. Si quieres, eh... Oh, don't worry about that one. Just just play the video and then we'll see. Yeah, let's do that. En nuestra casa no ha dado muchos fallos, pero la verdad es que... At home we've had a lot of failures, but Caldera had never really failed before. No es Caldera, sino es... This is no Caldera. It's just... Well, it doesn't want to launch and that's it. Now we're using the same portal, um, Guacamole, as I have said. Earlier, we're going to analyze everything through our browser. Now, as you've seen here, I have added Machine Caldera to Guacamole so I can administer it remotely through the CHS. CSH, and we're going to lift Caldera. We're going to download the Git. We're going to install the requirements and lift the server. This is something very easy. It does require Python 3.7 minimum. Our minimum is 3.5. And there's a new update that has come out recently. And, and we're going to show it to you and uh, see what they have improved. Now, on this video, what we are doing is attacking Windows 10. We access it through the console, and what we do uh, is because Windows 10 through Guacamole will not allow me to copy-paste, whereas with other machines it works. We still don't know why, by the way. Um, so because of that, what we've decided to do is access through the machines browser. We've had to do it like this. But you don't usually have to do it like this. You usually just do it through the agent. So we go on Caldera's interface because it's administered completely through web interface. You can also use the terminal, but it's much more visual like this, in my opinion. And in order to launch the attacks, uh, we use Sandcat, and we're going to establish the communication against Caldera, and Caldera is going to launch those attacks that we're going to prepare now. Now, as you can see, we just select the OS that we have. For Windows, you can install CMD or PowerShell, and then Mac and Linux, any version. So we open PowerShell here, we copy the command, we paste the command, and we launch it. And it says the connection has been successful. And now let's just open Caldera from our browser, and let's generate an attack. First of all, we're going to see if there was a connection other than the command that has told us that the connection has been successful. Let's see if the interface has seen it as well. So when we have a group of machines, in this case it's just one, but if we have a group, Windows uh, machines, for example, and we want to attack the whole machine, we assign the same group with the same name, and when we're going to launch the attack, we do it for the whole group. In this case, there's only one machine, as I was saying. But the demo that we were going to show was with two machines. We've decided to launch Hunter first. And Hunter adds a lot of discovery tactics that are going to help us to extract 
a lot of information from the machines. This is a default uh, pre-configuration, but then we're going to see how to create our own adversary. You can see everything that it has, and it's organized in different phases. You see that some have a padlock or a key, and that is because it requires specific information extracted from other phases in order to do that action. Sometimes, for example, it needs the machine's password or the IP. So through discovery, you extract all that information. So what we're going to do is to generate an attack operation. We give it a name. We select the adversary, which is Hunter in this case, and the group we are going to attack. And we just hit start, and as you can see, it's uh, working. It goes face by face, in this case only three, because it's the, f the first three. And Caldera is not perfect, because nothing is perfect, so sometimes it does fail, because it's still under development. So here you see that it has launched the who am I command. Uh, the machine has responded and it has stored that response. Now the good thing is that you can see the commands that are being executed. It explains the techniques that it is using. And so to, if, if you want to learn, uh, it's quite, quite useful. Uh, you just copy those commands and you will obtain the same information that we are showing here. That command is actually extracting the user accounts in that machine. And as you can see, some of them are win dom domain, which are the accounts of the domain that machine is linked to. This is one of the evidences that we have. Well, as you can see here, this is one of the most interesting ones, which is discovering whether there is an antivirus or not and where it is. And it does the same process with a firewall. It checks whether there is a firewall and where it is. It can also identify and it can create a directory just by executing that command we can create a directory in C in the user file this is what I was meant, uh, talking about before about firewall it tells us where it is and here it tells us about the folders that are being shared. And from here we can get a lot of information which is then stored. Uh, this is uh, the name of the domain, the machine the domain is integrated in. So local is the machine. Now, what we're going to do now is to create our own adversary, and you can see that we have used a pre-configured um, adversary by Caldera, and now we're going to configure our own with PowerShell. Shall we try and see if it works now, see if it's lifted, and if it is, then we can launch our own. We've been lucky, it's lifted correctly, so let's launch the attack that we're going to create. We're going to launch it on both. I had closed down Windows, so let's open it up again. And let's lift Caldera. So we lived Caldera, and we're going to check that in our browser that it really has actually lifted. 
as window 7 starts up. Windows 10 starts up. Sorry. La contraseña por defecto es admin admin, la que nos da toda la información de instalación. The defect password is admin admin. And Linux explains that it's here by default. And we indicate that we want to interact. So we have to habilitate that. In mock for the Caldera installation, we can put in our information and carry out a tack based on the data that we have from Caldera. It will be like little machines within Caldera itself without using up resources. And we can launch attacks on emulated clients. So it's an emulation of an emulation of, a, of, a, of an attack. That's exactly what it is. We have the calculators from the previous attack here. In the server machine, we can copy from Guacamole. We have our agent with PowerShell. And when PowerShell starts up, we'll do that. We'll start up the machine, the Windows client. So that we can copy the command that I mentioned before without opening the browser. So we have PowerShell as an administrator in order to carry out attacks. And some attacks require those kinds of privileges. Whilst it's uh, starting up, we'll have a look at the other one. We already have it. Let's see if it's not going to copy now. Oh, I'm afraid it's not copying either. So let's go directly. We're going to open up the page directly, open up the Caldera page, and we'll do it from there. We didn't really want to do that, but we're going to have to. That's not going to allow me to copy again now. There's a little bit of a problem there before, but it refreshed. And this does not usually happen. So let's open the page and copy the client. Like we did in the previous uh, video, it's very unusual that it's not working. It should work. It's just uh, copying. So whilst this is open, opening, we can see these machines are a little bit uh, slower because we've been asking a lot of them. And I think Elk is still working. So we already have uh, lifted seven machines, so that's quite a lot. So let's get the access through the web. Here we have it. So let's go to our Sandcat. We copy. Ahora parece que sí. 
And paste does seem to want to do it now. Let's uh, give it a chance to think. We can do the same action in Windows 10. Ah, mira. Este está detectado en inglés, ¿no? Sí. It's uh, detected it in English, right? Yes. Okay, off you go with that. Esto, los dos puntos, mira, tenemos por ahí. Ahí, ahí lo tenemos. So there we have it now. Que si se pone muy mal. So if it gets really bad, then we'll use the videos again. So we'll copy and do the same step once again. So let's copy. Oh, I'm afraid it hasn't vale. pasted. You can do this very easily at home, but we're going to continue with the uh, video because it's gotten a little bit complicated here. We were going to do this here directly, but we're going to use the video. When we create an adversary, we need to keep this in mind because otherwise it doesn't allow you to save. We have to create a description and we have our adversary. So what tactic are we going to use? It's uh, basically on execution. So it's the 1086 technique. It's the administrator emulated in PowerShell. And then we add 1059. And this opens the calculator if there is a calculator on our machine. The new Windows 10 does not have a calculator. You have to download it yourself from the shop. So the study of our adversary, we want to see the techniques that they use, that's what it's all about. We will assign a name. We select what we're going to launch and the group that we're going to attack. We wanted to launch this in the demo, but not also on 10, but on DC as well. On the old uh, Windows, it's available. We're going to see what it executes. It's going to deal with a file, the system administration through PowerShell. When this is generated, it gives us some time to create the logs and the registers and to maintain the machine as it was. The attack tries to remove everything that was generated previously. In Windows 10, there was the uh, calculator in this particular case. It has opened and it's executed through everything that we've injected through PowerShell. This is the new element that they've added recently. I saw it two weeks ago. And this, it is the part of the reporting. So once we've done our attack, we're given a report, including a download with information that we can treat. We have a list of all the attacks, as in Hunter through Faces, for example. We have them in this particular case, and those that are executed and those were not. All the agents, all the reasons. It's basic, but it's just recently been made available, and it's pretty good. 
We have a question. The idea is to show that it can open up applications and calculators, an easy application, and it's just to show that it can open up applications and lift an, app, lift an application. That's what we're trying to achieve. So lifting office would not make much sense. The calculator was always going to be there until recently. The most recent update of Windows does not have the calculator. If you want the calculator, you have to download it from the shop. You, you can open the calculator or anything else, right? Yes, yes. But it was just the calculator, just because it was uh, an example and something that was always going to be there. Is there any vulnerabilities in calculators? No, no. It's uh, just uh, what's used in the demos, and the, it's uh, the most usual thing. We opened the calculator in Power Exploit and with Detection Lab, but not only the calculator, but other elements as well. It was just to show that it can open up calculators and uh, applications. It was just an example. There are a number of applications, and it could open them as well. But it was just an easy, simple option. As we were saying, I haven't found anything, any applications that deals with the information that uh, you can find in Caldera. It's just a question of investigating in order to be able to treat that data. So this is what Caldera is. You can use this environment without any problems. If you've got eight gigas on your machine, you can use that at home with no problems at all. So the last one that we're going to see for attack simulation is the one that you have here. It's not open source. But it seemed interesting, and we thought it was important to include it. We've seen Caldera, what it does. It does uh, its things. It opens the calculator and so on. And this application is a business one, and it is completely aligned with MITRE. It installs an agent in the host. You have to put in a number of IPs, of course, and directly from an application in the cloud, in Amazon or wherever, it, there will be a configuration in order to attack the system. This is a simulation of an attack, like in Caldera. But it shows that it has entered. It's never going to leave a ransomware. It will never deal with the computer to that level. It just leaves a log, and you know that it's been attacked. It's never going to damage your machine. So we have it here, and let's have a look at it. Oh, dear. I wasn't expecting this. I really wasn't. But it's not a problem. We have it here. I'm always ready for these kinds of things. Here we have a, a demo account. This is the agent that you could use on your machine to do a number of attacks. There are a number of open fronts. We can't see them all, but we'll see the one for email gateway. And there are other applications to check security um, at gateway level. Side movements, ATPs, APTs that are directed. So what we're seeing here is the report section. I want a report, for example, that is from email gateway. I generate that from a technical level, executive level, or service level. And you can use that to see the, everything that has gone on with a great level of detail. 
Once that attack has gone on, we can filter through the ones that have penetrated. We have a number of different options for that attack. Okay. I just want to see the ones that have gone through. See. So the attack that we have seen was launched with more than 4,000 emails. And out of those, an X number have been penetrated in a few moments. This could take maybe four, five, six hours. And we use this to do our filter. We can see the ones with the highest risk, and we can see a description. And this is what I really like, a description of what is going on. We can see from that zip what you get is a, an Excel or PPT or whatever, and it's reached our machine. And then we get a bit more detail, and then the analyst can see if that fits in with our systems or not, and give an appropriate feedback. You can see that uh, the report is downloaded. We'd have a look at that later. So there are more than 4,000 attacks, as I was saying. This is a demo environment, of course, so there are a lot. We can see the description of each one. Even the new malware. Yes, we can. There are a lot of uh, attacks recently of a certain kind with a special module, and you can look at the view and see what has gone on, gone on and see if Tripbox would affect your system. You manage it and you test it. This is what we're doing with the Excel that's downloaded. We get that detail for the surface. I set in a number of filters of the information that I have been given. I see only the ones that have, been, that have penetrated. I can see the date and the hashes to show what really has gone on. We can see the high-level impact ones, and we get an introduction into what these threats are. It came through an email, and then went through the a JS or an HTML, HPA or whatever. And this is what I was talking about before, about mitigation. It gives you some pieces of advice. So the report is being generated, the technical report. Oh, the battery seems to have run out. Yeah, we've been talking quite a lot. Perfecto, perfecto. Thank you. That's perfect. Let's continue. So what I was saying before, the immediate threats would be the threats that could come up. So we can filter through the types of threats on a given hour of the day. So maybe we we'll just want to see the attack on the web vector. So I select them. I realize an attack, and I'll see what the results are. There you have a description of the ransomware, the date, and these are cases that come up, and they, these people incorporate them into their application, and they're pretty up to date. There are modules here through gateway, attacks over time. We can see the reports here. Although we don't have that much time left, 
que, que nada, o sea, la, la herramienta... So, anyway, eh, this, is, this is the tool, as I was saying, it's uh, very good, it gives a lot of information, and the implementation that they have done with uh, MITRE is very important. They also have an API uh, with which it integrates with many services. And it has a module with Splunk, which I saw the other day. We haven't tested it yet, but it looks good. It takes you directly to MITRE references. And it filters data. Say you want to test whether your organization is ready for um, data leaks through Dropbox or email. You just schedule it here and you just launch it on the machine that has that agent installed. See, and here we've got other tests, but we don't really have time now. So, well, let's just pause here. And just to see if it has worked. No, not working. And this is the last tool that we had for attack simulation that, that we wanted to show you. And we can talk about this later when we're done. And we have created our own infrastructure. We have launched our attacks. We have analyzed our attacks. We have visualized them on Splunk, see what they do. And because we are threat hunters, now we have to dump all that information on a playbook and hence register everything that we've been doing. So what do we do? We create a um, template like the one you see in here. You've got your, the data was created, who created it, how long you reckon this is going to take the priority that it has for the organization, and then we start writing the hypothesis that we mentioned at the beginning, that the faces, the different triggers that might create this threat, and we've been talking about execution on PowerShell, so you've got it identified here with the tactic 10, 10, 80, uh, T1086, then we describe the technique, which is very good, it's, it's very helpful for ourselves as well, then sub-techniques that uh, you can find within that technique. Now, a very interesting part, uh, threat intelligence, as you can see there at the top, which is the study, uh, but it depends on who is hiring you, say it is finance, banks, uh, energy companies. So I'm going to focus on the threats that uh, might attack them. So I go on MITRE, I check that group, and I write it down here. I even write the kind of software they use, whether they have active campaigns, uh, the capability that that actor has. So all the information about threat intelligence that we really like, obviously, and need. And then we go on to the next um, part, which is data source. Where am I getting that information? If it's PowerShell, but obviously it depends on the organization. So I need to know how my organization works. And I can see where I can get information from if it's not through uh, if I cannot see it on PowerShell, then I cannot get information. I, I could try to adjust different searches, but it would be minimal. I wouldn't have the full picture. So we just enter all the information here, what needs to be monitored, and all the actions that we take every day. So this is key. We have to write, on that day I created a lab, I gave it this configuration, then I did such and such test, I focused on a critical event, so on and so forth. So I just basically put in here everything that I find every day, and finally, the mitigations that we think can be then transmitted onto the next group who are going to analyze it and see the case study. And finally, um, on the conclusions, we write whether the hypothesis has been confirmed or not, or partially. This is the initial phase, then there will be another phase, and this is how we enrich 
our work. We write a few notes if we deem it necessary, and so our playbook for threat hunting is done. Now, conclusions that we've drawn, um, obviously you will draw your own conclusions, but for us, um, I personally haven't been doing threat hunting for a very long time. I started in July to uh, do research, break the laboratory, uh, work with it, see services, and I think this is absolutely amazing. I think it is the a kind of job where you need to know technically many, many areas, and we come from a forensics background, but if we have the full picture of what the attack is from uh, when it's that's still uh, how it happens, makes you grow as a professional, and that's why I like the most about it. Here you have uh, quite a few resources. These uh, all the resources that we have used uh, during this workshop. Uh, you can see they have Detection Lab. They, you have the you have Twitter accounts as well. And you can find there all the information, you can check there everything sometimes, even if you have questions, they might answer. Now, you also have links for Sysmon, where we have taken the configuration from. But you also have modular Sysmon and Sysmon X as well, which is currently on a beta version, but it has a lot of potential. Marcos Oviedo is responsible for it, we know him, and um, I'm checking when he's updating it to try and work with it. We, you have everything we've talked about, Sigma much more in depth, for example, uh, the, the translator uh, that we mentioned before, reference to virtual machines, to MITRE, to Caldera, and all the information that Roberto Rodriguez leaves there on thread hunting. So we are running out of time. This is the end of it. Thank you so, so much for being here. I know that the time wasn't uh, the best. I know that this is a very intensive workshop, but thank you, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, we're here to answer. Round of applause for them, please. You've got um, contact details as well if you need anything. And does anyone have any questions for Lorian and Carlos? Yeah, we've got one question there at the back. Great. And in any case, we're going to be around. If you have a very deep question at some point, we can have a coffee uh, outside. Well, congratulations on your workshop. And I was wondering, because you mentioned that Splunk, you have used a specific tool, but you haven't uh, agent, but you haven't said which one you've used for LSK. Which which ones have you used and why? Yes, because this was pre-configured on the virtual machine, so it is not us implementing it, but rather that it came by default in that big chart that we've shown you earlier. We didn't want to go into detail to just uh, give you a reference so you can then look into it in, with more detail. But have you tried uh, Wathu? Or, yeah, I have heard about Wathu, but I haven't tried it. Thank you. Any more questions around here? Uh, as I was saying, we're going to be out here. We can have a coffee with you if you want to, no problem. I was wondering what the most portable would be and which one you could take to other platforms, just say with a Raspberry 4 to take uh, for development teams and work teams. Take into account that this environment, because we are launching queries which need quite a lot of resources, such as 8 giga ramps, um, what I would recommend 
is uh, help that is the minimum requirements it has different modules you can configure the biggest one which needs a lot of resources or the minimal which has eight giga as, um, um, but also another answer if you don't have high resources you can always uh, do it on the cloud and then you don't need that many resources for your computer so for example detection lab uh, and for us the next thing we're going to do is implement it on Amazon for example and you can do it easily in the cloud yeah just with the account that Amazon gives you which is free by the way uh, you can just have that infrastructure done we've got limited time obviously uh, because otherwise it uh, costs a lot of money but yeah you could do it thank you any more questions I don't know if we have time yes we do have time if someone else has a question well, Carlos Lorin, thank you so, so much for being at CyberCamp 2019. Please a round of applause for them.